In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to our study of the book of Exodus. Today, we are walking through Exodus chapter 16. We're going to talk about the manna. And in a very special way, I want to really underline some things in this chapter that kind of echo throughout biblical history. So the manna wasn't just a miracle for 40 years, but it was a miracle that kind of echoes throughout biblical history. And we're going to talk about that as we go through this chapter. So let's go to Exodus chapter 16. I'm reading from the RSVCE, the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. And so let's talk about the manna that came down from heaven, the gift that God gave his people in the desert. And so it says that they set out from Elim. They were basically setting out, and this miracle is going to happen the second month of their journey. So they spent some time in this paradisical place called Elim. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. Now, it is kind of ironic that it's called the wilderness of Sin, S-I-N, but it doesn't mean what you think, okay? <laughs> this is not the English word sin. This is this is a, just a, simply a name of the place. So they came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, look at how the narrator underlines that <laughs> the entire congregation is murmuring. He wants you to see how the people themselves, as a complete congregation, have lost faith. And they said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, if you look closely at what the people say when they're murmuring, it's going to add a little bit of context to their murmuring because you can see how utterly offensive their comments are. Um, and in a special way, what they're doing here is they're rejecting God's work of salvation. They're refusing to acknowledge God's work of salvation. They're saying it would have been better to die in Egypt. And so you can see how utterly offensive their murmuring is. And so in verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now notice how he uses the phrase, I will rain, because rain was often considered to be a blessing of God. And here the Lord's saying, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The gift is bread from heaven. Notice the terminology. This is God's gift, bread from heaven. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion each day that I may prove them. So the manna is going to test the faithfulness of the people. God is going to see if they are faithful or not, whether they will walk in my law or not. And so the reference to walking in the Lord's law, being faithful, this is very important because it's, it's preparing us to understand the reception of the law in Exodus 19 to 24 and the covenant that Israel will enter into. And so it says on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And that's because they can keep the Sabbath. So it says that, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. Now, the concept of knowing the Lord and seeing the, the Lord's glory, it's very important. In one sense, this looks back to Exodus 6, 6, uh, verses 6, Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, where the Lord talks about how he will take his people as his own and bring them out of Egypt and they will know him. And so there's something beautiful about <laughs> Israel knowing the Lord who saves them. 
but then also seeing the Lord's glory. There's something absolutely profound here about being in covenant relationship with the Lord and, and knowing the Lord in an intimate way, so much so that they see the glory of the Lord who is present, working his salvation in their midst. And so there's absolutely something beautiful about these two phrases that they're going to know it was the Lord who brought them out of Egypt in the evening. And in the morning, they're going to see the glory of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Seeing the glory of the Lord in the morning. Okay. And it was Christ who rose in the early morning. I want to remind you of that. And he goes on and he says, because he has heard your murmurings against the Lord. Now, the Lord, notice how he says, you're murmuring against the Lord. The people are murmuring against the, the servants that the Lord has chosen, Moses and Aaron. But the Lord says, you are murmuring against the Lord. For what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your murmurings, which you murmur against him, what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Now, notice how it's underlining that they're murmuring against the Lord. And you have to look at the complaints that are tied to the murmuring as well to see how utterly offensive this murmuring is. So let's walk through chapter 16. I want to walk through my notes. It's a pretty long chapter, but there's some theological considerations that I want to highlight in this chapter that a lot of times people miss. So let's go through the chapter. So first and foremost, the chapter underlines the absolute offensive nature of Israel's grumbling in the desert. And if you really go through and do a word search and look at the word grumbling, how it's used as maybe a, um, in a verbal form, it's like 10 times altogether uh, that it's used in the chapter. There's, there's a lot of emphasis on Israel grumbling against the Lord. Another thing that it's important is the gift of manna is underlined and if you really consider this god as a loving father who called his firstborn son out of egypt exodus 4 21 to 23 is now going to care for his firstborn son and in doing so he's going to test the people to see if they are faithful to his law okay and so the manna let's look at some scriptures in the old testament and see how this is described because the lord says he's going to give them bread from heaven he's going to rain down bread from heaven so let's see how this is described in other places in scripture so psalm 78 25 describes the manna as the bread of angels or the bread of the mighty lechem Averim, okay? So it could be translated the bread of the mighty. And then Elijah multiplies oil and flour. Um, and so this looks back to the manna. If you look at this miracle of Elijah in chapter 17, the multiplication of oil and flour, it looks back to the gift of the manna. Elisha, or I'm sorry, Elijah, once again, he prays for death in 1 Kings 19. And it's an angel from heaven that brings him bread and water. Once again, it looks back to God giving his people bread and water in the wilderness. And it says in that passage, strengthened by this bread from heaven, he walked for 40 days and 40 nights back to Mount Horeb. So once again, this miracle, an angel bringing Elijah bread and water from heaven, and being strengthened by this bread to walk for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, it reminds us of the manna. Okay, so these are these are scripture verses that recall the manna that many people overlook. Second Kings chapter 4, 42 to 44, Elisha multiplies 20 barley loaves, and with 20 loaves he feeds a hundred men. Once again, it recalls the miracle of the manna. And so when you get to the New Testament, Jesus multiplies bread. He feeds 4,000 and he feeds 5,000. And that multiplication miracle, it looks back to the manna and it also anticipates uh, 
the gift of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. Something that's really beautiful, if you look at those multiplication miracles, look at how the verbs are used, a verbal chain, which is take, bless, break, and give. And actually the word for bless, uh, the verb could be to, to bless or to give thanks, okay? And so to take, bless, break, give, or take, give, thanks, break, give, you find that verbal chain in the multiplication miracles, and you also find it at the Last Supper. It's not an accident. There's definitely a connection between these multiplication miracles and the Last Supper. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is when Jesus multiplies bread, it looks back to the manna, but it also anticipates the gift of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And so in John 6, 31, the people remind Jesus that Moses gave them manna. And then in that context, Jesus gives the famous bread of life discourse, which is in John chapter 6, 35 to verse 58. You might want to go through and read the bread of life discourse, but it actually it's actually sparked by the request in John 6, 31, where they're essentially challenging Jesus to do something greater than Moses. Finally, in the book of the Apocalypse, Revelation 2, 17, St. John tells us that the one who is victorious will eat of the hidden manna, a reference to the gift of the Holy Eucharist. Revelation 2, 17, the hidden manna, a reference to the gift of the Holy Eucharist. So you can see how this concept of manna, it echoes throughout the scriptures. And so let's talk about something else. A little bit of chronology is very important too, because the manna miracle occurs in the second month, okay? So the Passover was celebrated on the 14th of Nisan, and this is, a, this is a guesstimate here, okay? So some might disagree with this uh, chronological order, but essentially Israel sings the Song of Moses on the 15th of Nisan, and then they're at Mara three days later on the 18th of Nisan, and then on the 19th of Is Is Nisan, they begin to camp at Elim. They're there for the remainder of the first month at this paradise-like place, Elim. And then finally, the second month is when they begin their journey in the wilderness. And that's when they cry to the Lord for bread and God gives them manna. So what's important about this is that as they begin that journey, the second month after the Passover, that's when God gives them the manna. You see a little connection between the celebration of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then finally the giving of the manna. And that's kind of what you want to see. And so that's when they begin their journey. The 15th day of the second month. So they've just started the second month. And as I mentioned in the notes, the whole congregation murmurs against Moses and Aaron, but the Lord underlines that they're murmuring against him. Now, the if when, every time they murmur, when you're reading the Exodus, look at what they're saying. You want to look at what they're saying, because the murmuring, which comes with the complaint, usually is a rejection of God's salvation or an inability to understand the work of God's salvation. And that's very important because as we live the faith, we wanna ask ourselves if we are truly considering the work of God's salvation that he has done and we're, are we truly grateful to the Lord? Are we, are we responding with praise and thanksgiving? Are we giving our life to him, recognizing the work that he has done? And, and in the complaints that Israel makes, you can see how they don't recognize the work of salvation. So some of the places where they complained, oh boy, there's a lot of them. Exodus 5.21, after the Pharaoh increased their labor. Exodus 14.11, when they were trapped by the Red Sea. Exodus 17.3, when they thirsted. Numbers 11.4-5, when Israel desired to eat flesh. 
um, and they grumbled because of the manna. They essentially rejected the gift of the manna in Numbers 11. And then Numbers 14, 2, they grumbled against Aaron and Moses, and they did not want to enter into the promised land. And that's where the Lord told them they would wander 40 years in the desert. Numbers 16, 13, Israel claimed that Moses brought them out of the land of that was flowing with milk and honey. So they, they thought they likened Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey, reversing what God wanted for them. Numbers 23, 20 verse three, the people quarreled with Moses and wished that they had perished with the others who had died before the Lord, referring to those who were disobedient. You can see how bad the murmuring was. Finally, Numbers 21, four through nine, the people spoke against God and Moses and they loathed the manna. Look at how they're rejecting the manna as the journey goes on, this very gift that God gave them. And finally, in Numbers 25, they worshiped a false god, Baal of Peor, and committed acts of immorality. This is the second great act of apostasy. So what does this show? It shows that with their murmuring, eventually they reject the manna and they fall into apostasy a second time in Numbers 25. Doesn't look very good, does it? No. And so look at what the Lord says. He says, I will cause bread from heaven to rain on them. The image of rain is very important because it underlines how great this blessing will be. And at the same time, the Lord is going to test them. They will have to gather a double portion on the sixth day so that they can keep the Sabbath. He's giving them the ability to keep the Sabbath. He's giving them enough for each day. Don't take any extra. So there's a great act of faith. You have to trust that God will continue to give you your daily bread. And what do we pray in the Our Father? Give us this day our daily bread, underlining that the Lord will give us all that we need every single day, just like he gave his people the manna. And in a special way, the reference to give us this day, our daily bread in the Our Father, St. Jerome underlines that it also contains a desire to receive the Eucharist as well. So in the evening, you will know that the Lord brought you out of Egypt. The Lord works a double miracle. He gives them quail to eat flesh, and then they will see the glory of the Lord in the morning when he gives them manna. And so the Lord notes, or Moses notes, that the Lord has surely heard your grumbling, that you grumbled against him. So the emphasis is on your grumbling, not against Moses and Aaron, but against the Lord. So in the morning, you will see the Lord's glory. I personally see this as a great act of God's mercy that here is this disobedient people grumbling, and God is saying, you, you're gonna know the Lord in the evening. You're gonna see his glory in the morning. Look at the chances, the opportunities that God is giving his people. A lot of people misread the Old Testament and they say, God is so cruel in the Old Testament. And I'll, what I'll tell them is that's because you have to read the text closely. And if you read the text closely, you will see how merciful the Lord is, how he gives his people opportunities. And in the New Testament, when Jesus comes, he gives us such, he gives us the greatest opportunity to receive his mercy. And so you can look at the Old Testament and if you read it closely, you'll see that yes, Israel did have a chance. Yes, God gave them multiple uh, opportunities and yes, he's doing the same thing right now. He's giving us an even greater chance. He's pouring out his mercy in Christ. But then when Christ returns, when Jesus returns a second time, he will come to judge the living and the dead. The opportunity ends at the end of our life or when Jesus returns a second time. So take advantage of this opportunity. Take, accept this gift of his mercy that he's giving you. Don't be disobedient. The letter to the Hebrews underlines how when we read the story about the first generation that was so disobedient, we can learn from this and respond with obedience and humbly 
accept the mercy of God and walk in faith with our Lord. So when they encountered the manna, this is one of my favorite parts in verse 15. What did they say? They looked at the manna and they said, what is it? Literally, they said, manhu, what's this? You know, what is it? Uh, and so they didn't know what it was. They did not recognize the gift of God. And I think that there's something very profound here because it can happen to us as well, where we sometimes fail to recognize the gift of God. They did not recognize this gift for what it was. And so that's really something important. So in Exodus 9 uh, through not Exodus 16, 9 through 10, Moses says, draw near before the Lord because he has heard your grumbling. The invitation to draw near to the Lord's presence. It's very theological. It's priestly language. You'll see this language used in the book of Leviticus. And so there's something very special about this invitation. Draw near before the Lord because he has heard your grumbling. He's going to manifest his glory and make himself known. And so the manna comes down with the dew. And that's really important as well because dew is often seen as the mysterious blessing of God. You can go back to the blessing uh, that was uttered and given to Jacob in Genesis 27, verse 28, where he's given the dew of the earth. And so it's it's often a reference to God's blessing or a mysterious blessing. The teaching of the Torah is likened to dew as well in Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. And so the manna, if you look closely at the manna, it's often associated with the Word of God and also with the Eucharist, okay? And we'll talk more about that at the end of this chapter. So the people said, what is it? Manhu, they did not initially recognize what the manna was. And Moses said, it is the bread which the Lord has given you. This is God's gift to you. And the concept of daily bread six days a week is so important. It, the manna is the Lord's gift. It underlines God's divine providence as a loving father. And also it is given to test the Israelites if they will follow his Torah or instruction. And so it, there's really kind of a threefold purpose between gift, God's providence, and also testing the faithfulness of Israel. So another thing that's important between, uh, you can say the concept of the manna and the Passover lamb, look at this, nothing could be left over until the morning. In other words, you take what you need and you consume what you need. You're not going to use what you that day what you take. You're going to have to go out another day to get more manna. And so very similar to how nothing could be left behind with the Passover lamb, you see what's called a thematic connection, a, a thematic connection between the manna and the Passover lamb. And that's very important as you're reading this narrative because you see how what started with the Passover lamb is continued with the manna. And that's important, especially because if you consider you had that Israel had to eat the Passover lamb and now they have to eat the manna. And all of this is preparing us for the gift of the Holy Eucharist. So this is something that's very important thematically, if you look at this, okay? And so the manna is gathered each morning, but it melts with the heat of the day. And it reminds the reader of the dew, which dissipates quickly in warm weather. So they gather it morning by morning, okay? And then there's a miracle on the day of the Sabbath. So you have to consider that here's the miracle that happened. The manna that's gathered on the sixth day it remains for the second day. So every so there's a miracle worked six days, but then there's also another miracle worked on the seventh day. The manna doesn't go bad. And a lot of people miss the Sabbath miracle when they're reading the um, you know uh, Exodus chapter 16. So I want to emphasize that. The fact that it didn't go bad, 
there's a seventh miracle worked. So really, there's a miracle worked every single day during the 40 years. It's absolutely amazing to consider. So what happened? Some people went out and gathered on the seventh day. They violated the command. Uh, and you can see this is not good. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Israel did the same thing when they came into the promised land. They violated the Sabbaths. Second Chronicles 36, 21 underlines how it was the Sabbath was continually violated when they came in the land, especially during the period of monarchy. So the violation of the Lord's command and instructions, the Lord exclaims to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? He's testing his people, but they're not responding with faithfulness. And he tells them, do not go out from your place on the seventh day. So it kind of reminds us a little bit of how Israel, when they celebrated the Passover, they were told not to go out of their house. Here, the Lord is saying, don't go out and look for manna. Stay in the encampment of the people on the seventh day. So you can really see how there's a number of connections back to the Passover. So Israel called the bread from heaven manna, and it had the taste of a wafer with honey. Notice the connection between kind of like a taste of honey as well. Um, and then they gathered an omer of manna. Some would say that this would be about two liters worth of manna, and they kept it before the Lord in the testimony. So it was put in the Ark of the Covenant. It's a reminder of how God prepared for his people to come into the promised land. And of course, it's really amazing just to think about that, that there was a little bit, an omer of manna. It's put in the Ark of the Covenant and reminds the people of how God was preparing. He, he was preparing for his people to come in the promised land, and he cared for his people as a loving father. And so Israel ate the manna for 40 years, 40 years years. But as I explained in Numbers chapter 11, they're going to get sick and tired of the manna. They're going to despise the gift of the manna. And so they do it. They, they bring this up in Numbers chapter 11 and also Numbers chapter 21. And so I guess I would finish by saying that God gave them this incredible gift, but Israel failed to recognize the absolute profound nature of this gift. And so the manna, it anticipates the word of God. Why do we? Why can I say that? Because in Deuteronomy 8.3, um, our Lord quotes this when he's tempted in the desert, by the way. Israel was told that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the, man, from the mouth of God. Jesus refers to this passage during his temptation. And then in the book of Revelation, John explains that the Lord will give to the victor, the one that is faithful, the hidden manna, to the one who is victorious and faithful, a reference to the Eucharist. So you see a subtle reference to the word of God and to the Eucharist. And what happens when we come to Mass? The word of God is proclaimed, and then we come forward and we receive the Eucharist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.